I can't tell you how great a pleasure it is to be here. Um, I'm no stranger to the Netherlands. I've visited here probably just about every year for the last 20 years. I've grown accustomed to your culture, your food, uh, your hospitality, your hard work ethic, and history. And probably one of the smartest moves I ever made in my life was I married a Dutch woman some 18 years ago. So she's taught me a lot about your country. Uh, so let me tell you, I should tell you a little bit of context. I am new to the church and even newer to the devotion of Our Lady of All Nations. I was married in Limburg in the, in the Catholic Church, but I was Protestant. But in order to marry my wife, she was a devout Catholic. We committed ourselves to raise our children Catholic. Uh, but as I, we began to have two children, two sons, it was my job to teach them about the Catholic faith, their Catholic education, their studies. And as I was teaching my children, I was learning about the faith myself and attending Mass, and I was learning right along with them. And I began to learn that much of what I learned as a Protestant about the Catholics was not right. So over a 10-year period or so, I began to, I guess to be, think about conversion. But as the case is generally speaking many times, it took a personal tragedy for me to make that jump to conversion. And in 2004, my Dutch wife was diagnosed with a very, very serious case of breast cancer. So as I looked at the prospect of raising a seven-year-old and a five-year-old boy by myself, I looked to our mother, the Blessed Mother, and asked for a lot of help and assistance, to which I am convinced I received a great deal, both myself and my family. So th thanks to God, the grace of God, and the help of Mother Mary, my wife is alive today. And I will tell you, as part of my conversion, I studied a great deal about, I was fascinated by Marian apparitions. So in 2008, we came for a family vacation to Holland. We decided to take a pilgrimage out of Thanksgiving for my wife's survival to Lourdes. And when we came back, I had stumbled onto the internet looking about Marian apparitions, this thing called Our Lady of All Nations in Amsterdam, and saw this beautiful image. And I thought it was remarkable that I've been coming to the Holland for more than a decade, and yet I was unfamiliar with the Lady of All Nations. So in 2008, I convinced my family that we would go from Limburg down south up to Amsterdam and we would make a quick stop in South Amsterdam and go and visit Our Lady of All Nations Chapel. And I will tell you that my wife was a little apprehensive. She's a devout Catholic and she was not aware of the apparitions, so I had to convince her a little bit to go, let's go look at this, this chapel. Let's go look at the image. And, and so we stopped, got off the train, and stopped in southern Amsterdam, and it was, it was neat a good situation. I got lost. So I was walking with my wife and two small children in some not particularly good neighborhoods in south Amsterdam looking for a house with the Lady of All Nations. And my wife was a little apprehensive. My children were upset because we were used to Lourdes. We'd seen the beautiful countryside of Lourdes. We had been to Benu, the beautiful apparition site in Belgium. It's also beautiful there. And this is a city. So we were a little apprehensive that we were not going to find the, the image of Our Lady. So we finally found the chapel, and we went in. And I was relieved to see the beautiful painting and image. We'd found the spot. So I left my family in front of the tabernacle, and I went back and got some literature, uh, the, the books, the biography on Ida Perdeman, the, the seer, um, and uh, the, the um, um, family of Mary sisters were very helpful and sort of reassured me and calmed me down after being agitated on my, my trip. But if you had told me in 2008 in the back of the chapel that I would spend the next three years researching and writing a book about the Lady of All Nations, I would have said you're totally crazy. So you see in life, and we know this in life, you can't predict your, 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 how your life is going to be up. There's going to be joys, there's going to be crosses to bear, and your life is going to take twists and turns that are beyond your control. And the best that you can do is hope that you're doing God's will in the process. And I'm a professor of international relations. Uh, I've been a professional intelligence officer for t almost 20 years, a professor of international politics. I study war. 
uh, for the last 10 years. And you see in the study of history that man is very bad at predicting the course of peoples and nations. We are very bad at anticipating what the next conflict is, is going to occur in, in the world. Uh, but, so I became fascinated by the 56 messages from Our Lady of All Nations because what struck me was that they are loaded, filled with predictions and prophecies about the course of international politics. Many people talk about the prophecies and predictions of Our Lady of Fatima, the beautiful apparition at Fatima, where Our Lady talked about the end of the First World War, the beginning of the Second World War, and the coming threat emerging from Russia to international stability. Uh, but what struck me about the messages of Amsterdam is they are much richer, much more extensive, and much more substantive than the messages of Fatima. And the attention to war, Orlok, in the messages of Amsterdam is quite profound. And even when we, we say the prayer, we talk specifically about war, which is quite unusual. Normally you don't have prayers of the church talking about specifically Orlok. Uh, above and beyond this, when you start to analyze, look at the messages in the context, context of international politics, what's remarkable is a great deal of predictions and prophecies have come to being. So this no doubt contributed to Bishop Punt's, uh, quite frankly, courageous decision to make a decision that this is of supernatural origin to which we're all indebted. Thank you, Your Excellency. Let me say a little bit, before we go into the substance of the messages, let me say a little bit about the difference between prophecy and prediction. Uh, prediction is a statement of what is going to become a reality. So when the Lady of All Nations in one of her first messages to Ida said that 5 May will be the liberation of Holland from German occupation during World War II, that's a prediction. It's going to happen. But a prophecy, on the other hand, is, is, a, is a warning that man has to change his behavior, turn to God, otherwise there's going to be severe consequences. Pope Benedict, in, in writing about um, apparitions and messages, has been quite clear about this, that in prophecies there's an opportunity for changing the course of, of events. We can change events, avoid degeneration, disaster, and war, and specifically with the Lady of All Nations case. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, is, is several things. I want to look back at the messages the, that took place in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Then I want to look at what I think are some of the prophecies that are coming to fruition and we see evidence of today, particularly when we talk about the Middle East. Uh, and then I want to look at the warnings of potential disasters and dangers that lie over the horizon that haven't come into being yet. And I want to say that I'm looking at this as a professor of international politics, international relations, as a student of war, not as a theologian. I am not a theologian. But I have to say that even if you take a secular analysis of some of these messages, um, collectively, it is very, very powerful evidence over the authenticity of the Lady of All Nations apparition. And indeed, the Lady herself in messages says that the proof is in my words. So if apparitions like uh, particularly Lourdes and Benu, you have authentication in miraculous healings, miracles, the authentication lies a lot in the predictions and prophecies contained in the messages. So let's look, take, look back into history and look at some of the content of the messages in the immediate aftermath of, of World War II. And let's talk about what the visions that Ida saw and then do an analysis of how do we interpret, how do we look at the contents of those messages. In a message in 1945, Edith saw a vision of an exodus, the Jewish, the Old Testament biblical exodus of the Jews from Egypt. And then she heard the words, something to the effect that, but Israel will rise again. Three years later, Israel is established as an independent state in the Middle East. And that was not a foregone conclusion. Israel had to fight a bitter war of independence against enormous numerical superiority by Arab forces. Uh, in 1945, 
Ida sees a, a, a vision of a red flag over China. And several years later, 1949, there's a communist takeover, a communist regime takes over in China. And, and communist China today does indeed have a red flag with stars, and this is indicative, or sort of illustrative of the type of symbolic visions that you see in the Lady of uh, All Nations messages. Uh, in 1949, Ida received warnings over a great fight around Korea to take place 1950-1953 time frame. And in 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. And I will tell you that that was a failure of intelligence. American intelligence failed to anticipate the North Korean invasion. In 1950, the lady reveals to Ida that the peace uh, in the Korean peninsula is a sham. And in 1953, the war open hostilities ends, but there's never any formal peace treaty. And what we've had since 1953 is a very, very precarious and unstable, instable situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the North Korean regime to this very day is, it creates a great deal of instability. Last year, it shelled a South Korean island and killed several civilians. Last year, it uh, torpedoed a South Korean uh, ship, killing over 40 soldiers. And it continues to aid and abet the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons technology, uh, ballistic missile technology, particularly in the Middle East and other parts of the world, to destabil destabilize international security. So that type of situation is indeed a sham. It's not stability, it's not peace, just as the lady said in Amsterdam in 1950. Uh, in 1950, Ida has a vision, an image, of this huge explosion taking place from the ground up in Russia. And it scorches the earth and blinds her temporarily. Uh, in 1949, just a year before, Russia, Soviet Union, had detonated an atomic bomb. But it wasn't until 1953, three years after Ida's vision, that it detonated a hydrogen bomb. Now, a uh, an atomic bomb is based on the technology of, of fission. So that's what takes place in commercial civilian nuclear reactors. That which you have in Germany and tragically what we've seen in Japan, that's based on fission. Uh, hydrogen bombs are based on fusion. And that's the nuclear process that takes place in our sun and in stars in the universe. It is much, much more powerful than a fission. So just by illustration, if an atomic bomb, depending on its, its, its payload, could destroy the centrum, the old stat von Amsterdam, a fusion bomb, a hydrogen bomb, could destroy all of Amsterdam. So this is, I think, what Ida got a glimpse of in this 1950 vision. Ida also receives visions or glimpses of the end of the Cold War. And in, I will tell you, in international relations theory, you don't get major transformations of the international system, uh, you know, major configurations of power, unless there's war, major war. So in Europe, we saw the devastation and collapse of empires in the aftermath of World War I. Uh, in the aftermath of World War II, we saw the creation of the bipolar distribution of power between the Soviet Union and the United States. There was every anticipation that the only way that the Cold War was going to end if there was major war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And yet, in 1945, Ida has a vision of the hammer and sickle, which is, of course, symbolic of the Soviet Union falling to the ground. And she also has a vision of the wall that divided East from West Germany just sort of going away at the wave of a hand. Uh, and implicit in that message is that there's no war that the Cold War will simply just pass into history, evaporate. In other words, if there had been anticipation of a war, you'd see some types of rockets or glaring uh, evidence of hostilities, and yet there's a wave of a hand suggesting that the Cold War will just collapse upon itself, the Soviet Empire will collapse upon itself as it did. And another interesting aside is, is that in 1947, uh, Ida receives uh, visions of secret meetings taking place in the Vatican. There's the Pope with papers on a desk being met by officials or see a representative of the United States, and Our Lady tells Ida that they meet in secret, and the Pope knows everything. 
in the aftermath of the Cold War, in the benefit of, I recommend, fine uh, biographies about uh, John Paul the Great by George, uh, theologian George Weigel, we now know that President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s authorized the Central Intelligence Agency and his senior officials to brief the pontiff, the Holy Father, about events behind the Iron Curtain. And there's also other images, although the, these images are a little more brief and more um, episodic. She has, Vaida receives visions of a war in the Balkans. Uh, and we now have war criminals being tried, or suspected war criminals being tried in Den Haag. She has visions of the Gulf War, which she thinks in later commentary was uh, the first Gulf War, 1990-1991 um, uh, war against Saddam Hussein. So taken collectively, these post World War II messages and predictions and prophecies over the course of world politics is, is collectively very, very impressive. So let's fast forward and may I have the next slide, please? Let's, let's talk about today. I told you I began working in 2008 uh, looking at the messages, reading about the apparitions. And one of the most startling messages, or the mo one of the most frustrating ones for me to try to figure out was a message related to Cairo, specifically Cairo. I, I've been very familiar since the 1980s with the security situation in Egypt. But the lady in 1947 shows an image of, specifically of Cairo, and it's, Ida says it's as if the world is torn apart, torn in half in Cairo. Uh, and yet in 2008, 2009, 2010, I would say nothing is happening in Egypt. It's, it's a, a, a repressive regime but it maintains order. There's a great deal of frustrations. Uh, uh, there's a big demographic bulge of young people with poor prospects for employment and for marriage and for families. There's a great deal of frustration, but the regime is maintaining power. And now we, in this year, 2011, beginning of the year, Egypt has a revolution. Uh, in the course of three weeks, President Hosni Mubarak is ousted in largely a, a popular uprising. Now, we in the West, particularly in the United States, there is a strong, strong affinity for democracy and that the ousting of a repressive regime is, is quite frankly welcomed. It's politically appealing to the United States as well as, as a good share of Europe. But Our Lady of, of All Nations' messages suggests that this revolution may not, will not be a good thing. It will be destabilizing. So what I have to remind my American colleagues and, and friends is that just because you get rid of a dictator doesn't immediately equate to the institution of democracy. A democracy requires an educated population, a culture and practice of, of politics, it requires institutions, and at the last stage, the last end stages of the process, then you have elections. If you have elections too soon, it can actually be very, very destabilizing. And, and even within Egypt itself, there is a growing recognition now that the problems of Egypt are systemic and are not going to be corrected just because President Mubarak has been removed. And what you see has been a rather quick reconstitution of the Muslim Brotherhood and actually a more recent development of what's called um, Salafists, particularly in the rural areas. These are more of a, a militant Islamic uh, bent uh, and the concern is if an Islamic, militant Islamic regime gets to power, it will remain in power and there will be no more elections. Uh, and as this development takes place and transpires, you already begin to see concern that Egypt's foreign policy is changing. Uh, there's also, there's been a change particularly regarding Israel. And the concern is, is that Egypt's peace treaty with, with Israel has been a cornerstone of stability in the Middle East, but a new regime may not support, may not support the peace treaty with Israel. And that changes the geopolitics of the entire region. Uh, Egypt has some 8 million people, 85 million people, and it's really a geopolitical center of the Arab Middle East. So Egypt's revolution was sparked by a Tunisian revolution in Northern Africa. It's gone through the region. There was some uprisings, but they were suppressed in Saudi Arabia, more violent uprisings in Yemen, violent uprisings in Bahrain that have been suppressed, uh, violent uprising in Syria. So there's sort of this cascading effect of the uprising revolution in Egypt throughout the region. 
And this, I think, will exacerbate a problem for Europe in particular when you have increased refugee flows coming from, from the Arab Middle East. It'll, it'll increase tension here mm -hmm. in Europe. And this kind of gives you a sense of what perhaps the lady meant by the world being torn apart between, and she mentions between East and West. This might be the type of fissure that she's talking about. And also interesting about the message regarding Cairo is Ida says she sees Persians. Uh, and this is very unusual for her to mention that because Persians come from Iran, but they are ethnically um, and geographically divided from, from the Arab Middle East. So Persians and Arabs traditionally have a competition for power in the Middle East. So if Egypt's revolution is a major geopolitical event in the world today, in 1979, the revolution in Iran was a major geopolitical event in the region. So what we see in the Middle East today is Iran competing for power and influence among the Shia Muslims, and Saudi Arabia and Egypt competing for influence among the Sunni uh, side of, of Islam. So you have the East essentially being split apart as well, exacerbating international security. So let me turn to this issue of Jerusalem and raise an issue. In 1947, Ida had a vision of heavy battles in Jerusalem. Uh, that may be a reference 20 years later, the Israelis fought an Arab-Israeli war from which the Israelis took power, took control from Jordanian forces of Jerusalem. But I wonder, when she talks about heavy fighting, I wonder if that might be a prediction or prophecy about future fighting, more fighting over Jerusalem in the future. I can't tell you how important it is to the world view in the Arab Middle East to have control over Jerusalem, whether it's Hamas, on the Sunni side, Hezbollah on the Shia side, they all, part and parcel of their worldviews is to retake, reconquer Jerusalem for Muslim forces. If we saw the importance of social networking and technology that contributed, fueled to the Egyptian revolution and the subsequent uprisings throughout the region in the Arab Middle East, we've also seen the importance of social networking in challenging Israel security just recently. Uh, opposition to Israel has coordinated from the east side of, of Israel, the northern side of Israel, and the western side in Gaza. Separate opposition groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Palestinians, have all coordinated to rush the border on the anniversary of Israel's founding. And this is, and this is something we have to watch for in the future challenges of, of international security. And that sort of leads us into the discussion of, of the messages and what we might inspect or what warnings have received in the messages for the, the future of, of warfare uh, in our world. Um, she talks about um, 1947 message, Our Lady of uh, All Nations mentions, after much fighting, China will return to Mother Church. Now this is quite remarkable. Many of you probably have had some dealings with the church or know of the church's situation in China and it's a very difficult situation. So this is definitely contrarian thinking, and it seems to be suggestive of internal unrest in China, which goes against conventional wisdom in much, many of the people who look at China's security situation today. And the Lady of All Nations also told the United States, told America to take warning over Taiwan. And Taiwan today is, the United States formally recognized China, mainland China, as the government of, of, of China. And Taiwan, it does not recognize formally as an independent state. But the United States does provide security assistance to Taiwan. And someday, Taiwan could formally declare independence or as, from China, which would be an insult to Chinese prestige and could very well set off a, a war between China and Taiwan and the United States backing Taiwan. Uh, and Ida also received in the messages some very powerful images of the nature of warfare with the use of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. Um, she, in one image, she sees a, a, a cigar-shaped object going by her very quickly. And if you'll see in the middle, that's a picture of an American Tomahawk cruise missile. And cruise missiles that fly horizontally and ballistic missiles that fly in a, a bell-shaped trajectory are becoming weapons of choice in modern warfare. Uh, another concern in international security is the proliferation of chemical and biological warfare. Uh, chemical warfare is the use of, of, of chemicals to, to kill individuals. 
Uh, we've seen in the history of warfare, we saw widespread use of chemical warfare in World War One. They did not use it in World War Two, And more recently, during the Iran-Iraq War, 1980 to 1988, Iran and Iraq both used massive amounts of chemical weapons against one another. And what we see is chemical warfare nerve agents are much more sophisticated than what was used in World War I, and you could get some on your skin and it shuts down your central nervous system. And these are kind of the symptoms that Ida experienced during One Vision. She said she was, uh, could not move, felt, you know, was still alive, but could not control herself. That might be indicative of, of a, uh, being a victim of a, a nerve agent. Uh, biological warfare agents, on the other hand, are living organisms, diseases, that are cultivated and weaponized to inflict, cause diseases against your, in your adversary's population. Now, we've not yet seen the use of biological weapons in a sustained manner in warfare, because they're very difficult to control. And they don't, when you give a disease to someone, it takes a while to have an effect on the battlefield. So we've not seen widespread use of biological warfare yet. Uh, but in the messages of Amsterdam, she's warning of us, uh, warning of this. And Ida herself seems to experience a, a swelling up or bloating of herself that might be a symptom of what's called anthrax. And that's a picture of it on the right-hand side. And that's a weapon of choice for in chemical warfare because it's very, very durable disease that can be trans uh, delivered with ballistic missiles or cruise missiles. Uh, we also have warnings or a vision from Ida that she saw deep inside Russia there was uh, glass facilities where research and development was taking place over chemical weapons and also underground facilities where people were speaking many languages. And it's very interesting that for, in 1972, most countries in the world signed a biological weapons convention that committed them to get rid of biological weapons, get rid of research and development of biological weapons. In the late 1980s, there was a Soviet defection, a scientist who defected from the Soviet Union who came to the West and revealed that the Soviet Union had been lying and cheating and had a very robust and aggressive biological weapons program. Uh, after the Cold War, early 1990s, a second Russian defector scientist also said that Russia was continuing research development and a biological warfare program. So the question is, is this warning about Russia's chemical and biological warfare program of past activities? or is it something that we have to worry about for the future? But let me just quote to you, and this is probably one of the most alarming quotes from the messages, 56 messages of the Lady of All Nations, at least from my perspective. And I worry about this in context of particularly biological warfare. Uh, 1955, the Lady told Ida, at a time of great, excuse me, a time of great invention is to come. There will be alarming inventions such that even your shepherds will be astonished and say, we are at a loss. And she reiterated, I just said, alarming inventions will be made. God allows us, but you peoples, you can see to it that it does not result in disaster. You peoples, I beg you, the lady begs you, hear this well. Never has the mother of God begged you so that you do not arrive at alarming things, nations. The lady begs you now. So, again, the lady does not say specifically to watch, in connection with this quote, biological weapons, but I worry. At a time where we're modifying genetics, DNA strands, it's conce entirely, unfortunately, conceivable that there could be modifications, genetic engineering of diseases that could be directed at an adversary in battle, and they could spin out and essentially corrode, affect, destroy, human genetic makeup. This to me is, is, is in line with the lady's begging, her warning, uh, and it's something for us humanity to be concerned with. So if we've looked at the messages and what's transpired, messages of post-World War II period, we've looked at the contemporary situation today, what seems to be transpiring as the lady warned, and we've looked at what's, what the warnings could mean for the future of international security in conflict. So let me now turn a little bit and step 
slightly out of my role as an international relations professor and talk about the implications of this for the devotion to Our Lady of All Nations. And again, I speak as lady. And here I uh, speak as a lake. Uh, first, we have, to, we have a responsibility to spread the, the prayer in, with the image. Um, and the lady said, spread it by modern means. Spread the image by modern means. Uh, and I have to say, speaking from my own experience, that's how I discovered the Lady of All Nations. So uh, it's important that we do this with much technological sophistication as possible. I will tell you in terms of the prayer, and this is a, a personal reaction, I recall reading the prayer for the first time in the messages as the lady wanted, and there's a controversial phrase, uh, who once was Mary, and this has caused a, a great deal of controversy. And I will tell you, reading it personally, Mary was very important for my conversion, um, instrumental in my conversion and my protection. So when I saw those words for the first time, who once was married, I was very upset. Yeah, my reaction is, don't take away Mary. Mary's, don't, you can't take away Mary from me. Uh, but as I've reflected on it and, and thought about it, uh, it, who once was Mary actually makes a great deal of sense. When you look at the history of the church, uh, whether it's Saul becoming St. Paul, or whether it's um, uh, Carol Wotaiwa becoming John Paul II, or Pope uh, Cardinal Ratzinger becoming Pope Benedict, uh, th there's a name change that goes along with the change in mission and function. And, and paradoxically, that actually lends a great deal of authenticity to the, the prayer itself. Okay. Because it's something new and different, and yet it's consistent with the history of the church. As reacting to the, the, the call for the fifth Marian dogma, as laity. I, I would tell you I've been helped a great deal by Bishop Punt's writings and, and Professor Mark Maravelli's writings. The, the idea when I first read about co-redemptrix, I was aghast. But as Bishop Punt and Professor Maravelli say, co doesn't mean equal to. It does not. Mary is not divine. But she does co-redeem uh, co humanity by giving birth to Jesus Christ. So Mary gives the blood that's shed on Calvary. So she crow redeems humanity. And I will say that there's a frustration from my laity perspective is that you have to prove the fifth dogma is correct. But to people that oppose the dogma, I would say, you prove that it's wrong. And I'd argue that you, it, it can't be proven wrong. She, she's advocate, she's mediatrix, she's co-redemptrix. All of it is true and can't be proven disproven. Uh, and let me add one more thing. There's a counter-argument against the fifth dogma, and the argument goes that it will offend or alienate Protestants. And I will speak as a convert myself. I became a Catholic because I looked at Marian dogma, particularly Mother of God, and said, believing it, what I do as a Protestant, the Catholics are absolutely correct by saying Mary is the Mother of God. So I would say to the Catholics, don't worry about what the Protestants think. Declare the truth, and the Protestants will come. Th that's a converse perspective. <laughs> that is natuurlijk het, het, het perspectief van een bekeerling. Uh, let me say a little bit about the, the church in Amsterdam. We are also called to have a new church in Amsterdam for the Lady of All Nations. That Our Lady should pick Amsterdam is really quite remarkable, and it makes a great deal of sense, strategic sense. Uh, it's a small country. It's seen as a, a positive influence in the world, and it's a microcosm of all of the peoples of the world. Uh, you have 177 people, at least, represented in your streets here in Amsterdam. And the Lady wanted to have a new church, I imagine, to signify a new rejuvenation of the Catholic faith and to be a crossroads, a meeting place for all the peoples of the world here in Nederland. And I, I have to imagine, or I have to believe, that the lady in the 1950s was warning about the, 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 the decay or dying out of the Catholic faith in Europe. And that this was in the 1950s when the faith was very strong and powerful. So she foresaw that, and I can't help but imagine she foresaw also the rise of Islam as a dynamic uh, building faith in Europe. And the direction she gave us for the construction of the church, in, in my mind, seems to be consistent with Ottoman-type architecture. To me, that's an extension, an invitation for the Islamic world to come and meet and engage with Catholicism. 
Let me just say a broad overarching views. Um, the lady calls above and, above and beyond anything else is to pay attention to the two great commandments, to love God and to love neighbor. You, you have to love God in order to love your neighbor, and if you don't love your neighbor, you don't love God. And to me, this seems to be, it's easy to say, but let's be frank, it's very difficult to do in practice. But I can't help believe that this is all the more imperative, the two grand commandments, because of the age of globalization. This planet is much, more, is much smaller, much more peoples interact, more people, greater challenges, greater potential areas for conflict in a time where the means of destruction are becoming much more powerful and destructive. And also she calls for us to say the prayer, promote the image, but also she pays attention to the rosary, such as we've just done. Uh, she shows an image of the rosary in a 1945 image, and she points to the rosary and said, because of these, these soldiers are going home, predicting the end of World War II. I mean, this vision, image, stressing of the, the rosary, the importance of the rosary is entirely consistent with the history of other Marian apparitions. I'm in the business of international politics and studying war. And I know that many of my secular colleagues, myself included, argue that at one level of analysis, you know, wars have to be deterred, and if they break out, you have to fight them, prosecute them, maintain interest, and get out of the war maximizing your interest. That's true. You're using diplomacy and force in combination to achieve interest. That's true at one level of analysis in international politics. Secular people will sort of scoff or laugh at the notion that prayer and the rosary could be instrumental in ending war, ameliorating tension and conflict in the world. But the Lady of All Nations call for people to return to simple faith. And people of simple faith, great faith, like John Paul II, argued the importance of us saying the rosary as a petition, a constant, steady petition for his help. And that puts God, the cross, back in the middle of the world to give God his due. So let me just end with, with, with this thought, that when we know that in day-to-day -day life, sometimes we get down. We get down, depressed uh, about attacks on the church. We get depressed about what Pope Benedict once wrote in a prayer for the Stations of the Cross, the, the filth in the church. Uh, we get down over the, the struggles for promoting the devotion to Our Lady of All Nations. Uh, we have struggles. We see this world in degeneration, disaster, and war, and we wonder what kind of, what kind of world are we raising our children in? All these collectively could, could bear very heavily on our souls and hearts. So let me leave you with this one quote. And this, if I gave you one of the most alarming quotes directly, let me give you the most positive and reassuring quote that I have. The lady gave a message in December 1953. She assured us, the powers of hell will break loose. They will not, however, defeat the Lady of All Nations. Indeed, they will not. The Lady of All Nations has already run the battle. Thank you all very much, and may God continue to bless you and all you do for Our Lady of All Nations. Thank you.